Hello everyone, Dave Landry here from DaveLandry.com. This is Trading Simplified. So what are we talking about? Well, I want to take a break from some of the things we talked about, and then maybe we can catch up if we have enough time toward the end on something like the Trading Psychology Crash Course I've been kind of going through lately. But I wanted to take a break from some of the things such as the, the mystery charts, the methodology in action, and the reality is I really don't have anything new to show you there, including my next 100 trades. But we'll pick that up starting again next week. I want to take a break and talk a little bit about bear markets. And again, you might be thinking, well, Dave, it's a little late in the cycle to be talking about bear market stuff. We need to know. It's like, well, I started talking about a lot of this stuff over a year ago. And that, I'm going to flesh that out in a little bit of more detail, too, in a few minutes. But there are some things I think you need to know. And then along those lines, I got to thinking about it recently, as I've been saying, I've been doing some presentations for a Chinese investment forum and because I really don't know the audience it's kind of hard for me to gauge the level of the audience I kind of brought everything back to the utmost basics and then I got to thinking about it recently it's like you know what everything really does boil down to the utmost basic basics first and foremost and then that's where you have to start with anything and I always start with a blank chart before I start adding indicators so I want to talk about that especially as it relates to the overall market. And again, we'll follow up on the psychology crash course in upcoming webinars if we don't have enough time today. Housekeeping, I do take requests. makes my job a lot easier, as I often say. Send them to davelander.com slash contact. Also, if you want the slides from this presentation and all the other slides from all the other presentations that I've done for Trading Simplify combined, including or in addition to a bunch of other stuff to keep you busy for a long time, limited access to my members area, all three of my books in PDF format, etc. You can go to davelander.com slash stock charts. By the way, if there's something you want covered and it doesn't fit into this venue, my Thursday shows are a little bit more open-ended, and also those are still live, so you can come in, interact, bring up some stocks you want to look at, ask some questions live. Would love to have you there. Every Thursday night, right now it's at 6 central time, and we're in daylight time, so it'd be since 6 daylight time and 6 p.m. daylight time. You go to daylight.com slash webinar for more on that. There's my Twitter, Twitter handle, he tried to say. Now, not a whole lot of methodology in action, but I did want to show you a little mini mystery chart, and I wanted to reveal it to make a point here. So we've got two markets here. This is going back to April. And this is as of yesterday. And if you draw sort of a line between them or paint a line between them, you can see for the most part, they have a 100% correlation, meaning one goes up, the other goes up, one goes down, the other one goes down. And I've done this before, and it's, it's I forget exactly how I did it. It's kind of painstaking, but if I could just raise one of these up to the other, they would almost have a 100% overlay, meaning that they're nearly 100% correlated. Now, I thought it would be interesting to add in a third market to this. And again, I think it would be easy to raise up to these other two. I'm not saying it would be 100% correlated, but the correlations are super, 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 super high. Every now and then, like back here, you can see they, they get a little out of phase, okay? At least the, this market here did. But for the most part... And for most of the time, the correlation is 100%. So again, if you just kind of draw a broad stroke through them all, you can see for the most part, aside from a little flipping back and forth recently during that sideways chop, they were, for the most part, nearly 100% correlated. Now, what are these markets? First one, S&P 500. And the next one is Bitcoin. Now, the reason I wanted to show Bitcoin is because it has this amazingly high correlation to the S&P 500. And the, the crypto bulls, which I was a crypto bull when crypto was going up. And if somebody criticized me back then, I, I know some people were criticizing crypto, but it was going straight up. And they criticized crypto, it was Bitcoin at 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, 40,000, 50,000. 60,000, the whole way up, and then when it finally starts rolling over, they're like, you see, I told you. Well, they just missed a huge ride, and I'm a little disappointed in some of these individuals because they are technicians, 
and they have confused the issue with facts. But anyway, I digress. Getting back to the Bitcoin permables, the HODL type, H-O-D-L type, their thinking is that Bitcoin is going to save us, and if the market crashes, we can go into Bitcoin, and if the SHTF will go into Bitcoin. Well, based on this chart here, and based is the, the S&P 500, it doesn't look like Bitcoin is going to be a good proxy. Now, if you did have some sort of investment that did the inverse of the S&P 500, then that would be fantastic. In other words, if it went up when the market went down, that'd be great. But Bitcoin is not that market. So the market I want to add in here is bonds bases the TLT. Now, what's interesting is there's a fairly high correlation with bonds too. Point, again, you have to be careful of is a lot of times, especially when you're in a liquidation type of market, everything gets sold. And that's kind of a longer term example, but if you've been trading for more than a few days, you've probably witnessed, especially the bear market, of course, you've probably witnessed these days where gold gets creamed, bond gets, bonds gets creamed, and stocks gets creamed. So there's really no place to run, no place to hide. And that just tells me that people are just liquidating market at all costs. As I often say, quoting Tom McClellan's late mother, Mary, Mary, Marion McClellan, some people buy when they have money and some people sell when they need money. Well, when the market starts dropping, it becomes a need money type of market and everything gets sold. So never forget that sometimes in a market, there's no place to run, no place to hide. Now, back last summer, as I've said quite a bit, I wanted to do a show to get ahead of it, so to speak, to get ahead of the market timing. So I waited until the market was at all-time highs and decided that, you know what, it's a good time to do a show on market timing. And I named it Before the Bomb Blows Up because no one calls me when the market's at new highs. And by no one, I mean my friends and family, obviously. They all wait until they're down 30 or 40%, and then they call me in a bit of a panic. Well, I thought doing that show would help me get ahead of it, but my phone's starting to ring now. <laughs> anyway, I digress. So last year, right around the time, the or year before, I should say, when the SHTF, when the pandemic slide began in earnest, one of my relatives decided to tell her brokerage to go conservative and put a big hunk of cha uh, change into a conservative portfolio, so to speak. So they put her in a few other things, including gold, which, all, which also unfortunately imploded. But one thing they did was they put her in a bunch of these fundamental conservative funds. And by the way, these funds, most of them, I say, were ran by their brokerage. And I don't know. I don't want to be too skeptical. But there's probably 100,000 mutual funds out there. I know there's more mutual funds than there are stocks. It makes you wonder, were their funds really the best funds they could have put her in? But I digress. The point I'm trying to make here is as you go through these conservative fundamental investments, you could see all of them imploded along with the market. So the point is that everything gets sold during a bear market and you could have a lot of positive correlation, meaning that everything ends up going down. So the moral is there's often no place to run, no place to hide in a bear market all asset classes get sold. If you go to my website, at the top of the website, I have bear market updates. And somewhere buried in those updates, I have an article called Cash is Not Trash, which is pretty much what I'm telling you here today is that everything goes down. And sometimes cash is not trash. It's okay to have cash on hand as opposed to looking for someplace to put that money. A lot of people always feel like they have to have their money working, so to speak. Well, sometimes, as they often as they often say, not me, as is often said, I should say, is return of capital is more important than return of capital or seeking return of capital, I should say. So check the correlations of your investments. And conservative fundamental investments get sold too. In some cases, they could really be a, a source of funds. And it's a little ironic. You would think that people would dump all the speculative stuff. And, and that stuff gets dumped too. But sometimes people hold on to the crazy speculative stuff. And they start dumping the good stuff, so to speak. Well, nothing is good as far as I'm concerned if it's going down. I think it was Chris Pugh 
once said, "There's no no stock has a halo in a bear market." And I thought that was kind of interesting. So no place to run, no place to hide. I would be leery of relative performance. I was in a presentation a few weeks back with Dave Keller, and I said, "You can't eat relative strength." And by that, I meant if one stock is going down less than another, or one sector is going down less than the other, it's still going down, and you're still losing money. Now, he came back with, well, when I was in the institutions, or institution, I should say, we ate the relative strength line, so to speak. And his point was that if you're a large institution and you have to be invested, people are expected you to be in stocks, then you want to be in the stocks of the sectors that are going down the least. That's fine, and it's a bad investment from, from an individual standpoint, but as a private trader, we don't have to always be invested. Again, cash is not trash. Now, as I said earlier, I want to come back to the basics once again. And a lot of people, I get a lot of emails from people they're like, Dave, I can't believe you just draw lines on charts and that's all you do. It's like, well, I do a little bit more than that. I do the moving averages, and I'll show you those in a few minutes. But other than that, the moving averages, that is, I really don't use any indicators whatsoever. And I think the net-net price movement is the most important thing you could do. Start there, but then make sure you come back off. So let me just show you what I mean. And this stems from, as I said earlier, working on some presentations for the Chinese Investment Forum where I wanted to show some really simple things for them to look at to gauge where they are in the markets before we got into moving averages and all this other good stuff. Anyway, you can see that we're in a bear market and the market has gone down about 25% peak to trough. Now, if we start looking at what happened and if we kind of rewind and go back in time, First thing happened was the market dropped 12%, and then it rallied back up 8.8%. This is on a closing basis, obviously. Now, the market began to sell off again, and then lost 10.5%. This time, it rallied back 12.3%. So, it's like, okay. Well, at this juncture, I figured the market was in a lot of trouble, and we started getting some sell signals way back here. And I figured that, okay, we're still in trouble. It rallied up a little bit, stalled out, went down. So thrust, pull back, thrust. And then we have this big old huge retracement. Well, I didn't get too bullish in here, even though we were just a couple of percent away from all-time highs. And the reason I didn't get too bullish is like, okay, if I get bullish in here, then I'm going to be a little bit early. I'll be about 2% early if this thing hits new highs and goes beyond. It's like, you know what? What if I just sat on my hands a little bit and waited for this thing to make new highs and stay there before getting in. Yeah, I might be getting in a little bit late, but I'm willing to give up that that 2%. And then the market obviously rolled back over. It made a 17.85% leg lower. Did a little retrace once again of 9.65%. And then sold off fairly hard, down 12.9%. Now, I guess it's good that we didn't go down more than 17.85%, but we went down nonetheless and then we had this little retrace recently up 8.2 percent by the way during a bear market you could have some really 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 serious rallies and not to digress too far imagine that <laughs> but the tfm 10 percent system as you know is based on the 50-week closing high and someone would say it was saying what if you put an indicator off the closing lows and it's like it would work but the only problem is these big retrace rallies like 12 percent here and 10 percent here and eight percent here would likely get you in too early because sometimes the markets bear markets at least have these super big rallies just enough to make everybody feel good squeeze the shorts out right before the market rolls back over now, after being all bearish on you, we do have falling tops, okay, or falling peaks, however you want to look at that. For the most part, at least since April or late March, we've had lower highs and lower lows, and that is a downtrend. So we're still in a downtrend longer term, but one slight little glimmer of good news is we have been going sideways for the last four to six weeks. So that's a good thing. Now, don't buy a market just because it's not going down a lot or as much 
or sideways, but do pay attention to see if it can begin to rally and maybe take out some recent highs. Along the same line, also pay attention to see if it goes down to make new lows, obviously. But right now, we're kind of stuck in the range. By the way, it's been really choppy lately. I can't find a setup to save my life. So again, it's okay to sit on your hands. It's okay to sit in a little cash. Not to be shot on Friday in case you're fully invested, but I tell you, I've been saying this lately, is it's been nice logging in and just seeing one or two stocks in my portfolio and everything else mostly cash, just waiting for me to take some opportunities when they come along. Now, one thing you might do is maybe wait for a daily bow tie to come together and go from downtrend proper order, meaning the 10 is less than the 20 exponential and the 20 exponential is less than the 30 exponential. And you can see these are the numbers up here, 10, 20, 30. The 10 is simple, the 20 is exponential, 30 is exponential. When the 10 is above the 20 and the 20 is above the 30, it's an uptrend, proper order. When they flip over, it goes to downtrend, proper order. So obviously coming into 22, the market was in an uptrend basis. This indicator, or as I like to call it, illustrator, because it just shows you what's already in chart. It's no, it doesn't indicate what's going to happen. It just tells you what already happened, right? But you can see it flipped over. Now, a major signal is a signal that comes off of all-time highs for the stock market, at least, or at least multi-year highs in a stock. Or sometimes all-time highs would be a good way to look at that one, too. And then for a major buy signal, it would have to come off for stocks, I would say, a 5- to 10-year low. But you can see the market did roll over. Now, this is what I call a minor signal because we were only hitting multi-month lows before it turned back up. It can help keep you on the right side of the market, but you can see that that new trend never really did materialize from that minor signal. And the next signal we had down, I would call a minor signal, but the only caveat or only thing I would add, I would say, is that your last major signal was up here, so you're not that far off of all-time highs. And the trend so far is down at this juncture. So at least it's with the trend as opposed to against the trend. And you can see the illustrator, if you want to call it that, or indicator on the bottom. Just helps to let you know when those have flipped over. Green is uptrend proper order. Red is downtrend proper order. And yellow means they're somewhere in between the two. By the way, the closer the red is to the green, the quicker it has flipped over and that gives you a little bit more powerful signal when the market moves so fast that you have very little yellow in between. Yellow is when one is just kind of crossing, meandering back and forth against the other. You see right here, they didn't come together and cross over, but they began to cross a little bit. So that's when you go yellow. So it's kind of cool with the green, yellow, red or red, yellow, green to let you know like, okay, we're green. So things might be okay, but oh, we're yellow now. So maybe things are changing. And then it could be red, like things are not good, going to yellow, like, well, maybe things are improving, going to green. But again, you want to pay attention to those major signals and minor signals along the way. In this particular case, should we cross back up, it would still be a minor signal based on the fact that we're not coming off of multi-year lows, at least not just yet. Now, if we take a look at a longer term S&P 500, and we're still in the daily chart here. You could see that we would be down around one year plus lows, but not like five or 10 year lows. So this signal here, should it occur, should we turn green, would be more major than something like this one here, okay? It'd be more important, but it still wouldn't be what I call a major, major, major signal. So right here, obviously, again, coming into 2022, I'd see this as a major signal. So again, we go back in time, you can go all the way back to 2021. So we're just right around these one year or so lows. Now, as it gets further and further down, and let's hope it doesn't, but as it gets further and further down, should it get further and further down, I should say, then that would be of a bigger concern, obviously. Now, the weekly bow ties can help to keep you on the right side of the market, but keep in mind, there's a lot of lag in the weekly chart. So you can see in the pandemic, we crash so fast, so to speak, that the bow ties had no time to really catch up. So they were too late back then. That's okay. We were looking at daily signals, as I've said quite a bit. And also, we did have a longer-term sell signal, the TFM 10% system. 
had a sell signal to my surprise before even the daily bow tie kicked in. But you can see we bow tied back up on the weekly, and once again, this was a minor buy because this wasn't off of multi multi year lows, but still, when it happens on a weekly basis, it's worth paying attention to, and it can help to keep you on the right side of the market. But obviously, it was a little late. Now, getting back to the major signals, obviously, when we rolled over back here earlier this year, the weekly did catch up fairly quickly because of a bigger scheme, a longer term view scheme, however you want to look at it. Remember, each one of this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 or so weeks in here. It did catch up and we did get a turn down. So this would, it would be a, what I would call a major downturn based on the moving averages. And we would have to drop significantly to, and then turn back up to get a major buy basis this. But shorter term, we have been improving by trading sideways. But let's not get too excited just yet until we begin to see some upside follow through so the point with all this is never forget about the net net okay price change when you're looking at markets never forget about the correlation and remember there's no place to run no place to hide okay so we do have a little time left over i was asked as i've been saying quite a bit to do some presentations for this chinese investment forum and they're no longer holding it um in china because of the COVID issues obviously but hopefully they'll return to that and maybe they'll remember me and that's that's why i'm doing it uh <laughs> maybe i get a little uh, trip over to china anyway getting back to the trading psychology what i wanted to point out was some major things that in addition to trading psychology there's a neurology involved to where you cannot make decisions without emotions and stress because each decision has a consequence and Further, and there's a, another part of your brain that works on this too, is you can't make decisions without feelings. So everybody tries to separate themselves from the feelings and emotions when it comes to trading. And there are some things that you could do to kind of help you with that. But my big epiphany when I first learned about trading neurology is that, hey, just embrace that's the way it is. And you're going to be emotional and take some steps through the money management, through the position management, maybe using stops for entries and, and the commitment devices and all these other things I'm off to talk about to help you with that. Now, last week when I was talking about emotions and feelings and reasons people buy and sell stocks, some people buy when they have money. Again, some people sell when they need money. Getting back to Tom McClellan's mother, Marion, Always ask yourself on a trade, am I buying because I have money? Am I selling because I need money? And I've, I've got to really watch myself. I'm as guilty as anyone. And I, I'm a firm believer in my core methodology in trading for longer term gains, trading for both shorter term and longer term gains. But the longer term gains are really where the money is. But I do feel myself firing off some intraday trades here and there. And I talk about that every now and then in my Week in Charts show. And one thing that I'm guilty of is if I have a really good day, like yesterday I had a really good day, I am more inclined to come in the next day and, how do I say it nicely, could not say anything uh, that not PG-13, let's just say give away some of that money the next day. So a lot of times, again, I'll come in after a good day and I feel like buying or, or shorting or whatever just because I have money. i got to watch myself from that. So always ask yourself, when going into a trade, are you buying because you have money or are you selling because you need money? Or is there any other reason that has nothing to do with trading? And this is something I can really flesh out quite a bit. But for now, just ask yourself that question. I think you'll find the answer yourself. And the other thing, of course, is are you doing something for more sophisticated? And is that what you should be doing? And along those lines, too, of things you shouldn't be doing... Because I'm in touch with so many different people, I see a lot of people doing a lot of things. And sometimes I feel like, you know, I might want to jump into that trade for fear of missing out. FOMO, so to speak. And that methodology might not have nothing to do with methodology. It might be a totally unplanned trade. And I have to be really careful because I know myself and I have to pay attention to those type of things. So are you buying because you have money, selling because you need money, or is there some other reason, and some other reason that has nothing to do possibly with your methodology?
So what I would encourage you to do is gain confidence in your methodology. You want to pick the best, leave the rest, okay? And then plan your trade, of course, and then trade your plan. And then after you do all that, you need to do a post-mortem, and you got to be careful about resulting, which is an Annie Duke term, meaning if you made money, you didn't necessarily do the right thing. And then rinse and repeat. And should you find yourself at a pretty serious drawdown, just make sure you're doing what you should be doing. And sometimes you might have to go back and regain confidence in your methodology. Well, here's the good news that I promised we'd get to a couple of weeks ago. The good news, and I have many stories about this. Maybe I'll share one or two next week. But the good news is a stock speculator sometimes makes mistakes and knows he is making them. Obviously, that's Jesse Livermore. And next week, I'm going to give you some tools. Good news is you know what you're doing wrong. Well, that's all my time for this week. I want to thank you guys and girls for watching. Anything unanswered, you can reach me at davelanner.com slash contact. Thank you so much, and may the trend be with you. Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're going to bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.